I'm going to open us in a word of prayer. I'm going to open us in a word of prayer and we'll get started. Father, we're grateful for, for your eternal truths. Uh, you don't change and your word does not change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. The prophet Isaiah tells us that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God abides forever. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So I pray, Lord, that you'll be with us today as we seek to study your word, um, investigate your word. We do pray for the illuminating ministry of the Spirit, whereby we can understand the things of God. Uh, in preparation for that ministry, we're just going to take a few moments of silence to prepare our hearts to receive from your word today. We're thankful, Lord, for the promise of 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, and the many promises you've given us. We're thankful for our eternal position before you through Jesus, and we're thankful for the fact that your provision is so comprehensive for us that it even um, allows for the restoration of broken fellowship and enjoyment of you, something that could inhibit our ability to receive truth from you today. So I pray you'll be with us in this particular study and in the Bible study that follows and the main service and also all of the different uh, classes um, that are meeting. Uh, I pray that um, you would have your way today here at Sugarland Bible Church. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. Well, if we could take our Bibles and open them to 2 Thessalonians. <clears throat> Chapter 2 and verse 9. 2 Thessalonians Chapter 2, verse 9, continuing our movement through verse by verse the book of second Thessalonians Paul as you know had been kicked out of the north there and driven down south into Corinth uh, kick, kicked out of Thessalonica driven down into Corinth having planted before he was forced out that church thriving church there in Thessalonica And this church had a problem. Can you believe that? Churches back then had problems. I'm glad that doesn't happen today. I'm being a little facetious there, but their problem was uh, confusion. They had received a forged letter, allegedly coming from Paul, contradicting the theology that he had already taught them. And that forged letter is alluded to in verse 2. It says that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed either by spirit or message or letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord, which is the tribulation period, has come. So Paul had taught them initially that they would escape the tribulation period <clears throat> because the next event for them on the prophetic Horizon was the rapture. The forged letter allegedly coming from Paul says, no, um, you're in the tribulation period itself. And if there's a rapture, it's, a, it's, it's at the end. So obviously receiving something like that would shake them up because it put them in a, a bad place, first of all. And secondly, it discredited Paul's ministry before them. So this is why Paul in the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians straightens them out on sequence. 
Basically what he's saying is you're not in the tribulation period or the day of the Lord because if you were, you would see five things which you no, no one has ever seen. Number one, the departure hasn't happened yet. And we tried to argue that the departure there is a synonym for the rapture. So Paul is just saying, you know, you're still here. Which you wouldn't be if you were in the tribulation period. Number two, um, and you can see the verse divisions where you can find these concepts. Number two, you have not seen the Antichrist desecrating the temple. And so we talked all about that future event and what it means. And Paul's point is, you know, that hasn't happened. Number three, you have not seen the removal of the restrainer. And we tried to make the case that the restrainer is the Holy Spirit who dwells in the Christian. So as long as the Christian or the church is here, the restraining ministry continues. Once the rapture happens, that restraining ministry ceases and the Antichrist will come forward. So the, the removal of the restrainer, which is another synonym for the rapture, hasn't happened yet. And then the fourth thing you have not seen is you have not seen the destruction of the Antichrist and his followers, which is a verse we covered last time. It's right there in verse eight. He says, then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. So at the end of the seven-year tribulation period, Jesus is just going to speak to this Antichrist and he's going to be defeated immediately. And there's a lot of other verses that support this. Um, you know, the breath of his mouth is speaking of Jesus speaking the word. Isaiah 11 verse 4 says he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Revelation 19 verse 15 describing Jesus returning says from his mouth comes a sharp sword. And that sword or that yeah the sword rather is God's word. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. So you have not seen uh, this antichrist personally overthrown by Jesus, which you would see if you were living towards the end of the seven-year tribulation period. And then very interestingly, he explains why it's only Jesus that's gonna overthrow the Antichrist. The Antichrist is just too powerful. And he describes verse nine, the power of the Antichrist. And that's why we've entitled this uh, lesson, Satanic Miracles. He says in verse nine, that is the one, the Antichrist, whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power, signs, and false wonders. Now as I'll, I'll show you today, false wonders doesn't mean that these wonders that he's doing are somehow not real miracles, they are. But they're false in the sense that people think that they're coming from God when in reality they're not coming from God at all, they're coming from an alternative source of power uh, in our universe called the devil. So we're gonna make some comments today related to verse nine concerning the reality of satanic miracles. Not every single miracle that happens in scripture is something that God brought into existence. And this is actually a big deal because a lot of people <clears throat> gauge truth based on an experience. Something is true because they had an experience. You know, Muhammad thought that what he received was true because he had an experience. Uh, Joseph Smith, who started the Mormon church, thought that what he had was true because he had an experience. 
And so this gets into the area of what we would call um, epistemology, which is a fancy word. It just means how we know what we know. How, how do we as Christians determine what's true? We're living in a culture and a society that says something is true because they've had an experience. There's a large um, sector of the body of Christ that believes this also. Something has to be true because they had a miracle in their life. They had some kind of experience. And I'm here to tell you that experiences, as I'll show you today, are, are not the way to determine whether something is true. You determine something is true, meaning from God, based on its alignment with God's revealed word. If it does not align or conform to God's revealed word, it doesn't matter how wonderful the experience was. It cannot be of God. So the Antichrist is going to show up and he's going to give people a lot of experiences. And the world is going to say, well, this, this is of God because look at what this man does. And yet Paul calls these powers and signs and wonders false, not because they're not real miracles, but they just came from the wrong source. So before I get into this subject of satanic miracles, I wanna also communicate to you very clearly that yes, Satan does have the power to perform miracles, as we'll see, it's clearly revealed in the Bible but his miracle working power is not on par with God's power. He has a lot of power. I mean, compared to us, he looks God-like. But the scripture is very clear that his power is not greater than God's because God is the creator. Satan is the created being. So Genesis 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the greatest miracle that we know of that God did, right there in the first verse of the scripture. And if you believe that's true, then you can't be an atheist because it says God created. Atheist denies God. You can't be a pantheist you can't worship nature or creation because this verse says God brought creation into existence. You can't be a polytheist, believe in many gods, because this verse says God created. You can't be a humanist because man, humanism exalts man. Man wasn't even around when God did this. Man wasn't even there as a consultant. You know, it's not like God is asking man's permission. What do you guys think if I do this or that? Because man doesn't even show up in the creation week until day six. So obviously humanism, man is the center of all things, could not be correct if you believe what verse one says. And then you can't be a naturalist. Naturalist is... Fancy name today is evolutionist, but everything came about by itself naturally. Well, this, this verse says there was a time in which the heavens and the earth didn't exist, and yet God brought them into existence through a miracle. And then the one I have underlined here is you can't be a dualist. You know, a dualist is someone who believes that God had a, has a rival in the universe, God has no rivals because he's the creator. Everything else is created, so there's no rivalry at all. There's, there's not even a contest here. And I bring this up because a lot of people get their theology from the movie Rocky. I remember my, my dad took me to see the, the first Rocky back in the late 70s. Now it's like Rocky, 5,000 or something where their great grandkids are fighting and stuff. But this is like the original Rocky. And uh, they had the boxing gloves hanging from the sign out front, you know, cool stuff like that. But anyway, you know, you're kind of sitting on the edge of your seat, you know, throughout the whole movie, particularly the end, the fight scene, because you really don't know who's going to win. Because these guys are pretty, you know, equally matched. 
you know, slight edge for Apollo. I think he, Carl Weathers, the actor, I think he passed away recently, if I remember right. Um, so you really, you really don't know exactly who's going to win this. And a lot of people look at the contest between God and Satan as it's like Rocky and Apollo. You know, we, we don't know who's going to win. We're going to have to just sit on the edge of our seats till the end to see who's going to pull this out. That's what you call dualism. And if Genesis 1 verse 1 means what it says and says what it means, you can't be a dualist because God has no rivals because he's the creator. Satan is nothing more than the created being. So when you study the miraculous powers of Satan, which we're going to do, based on verse 9, you shouldn't get the impression, you know, I should, we shouldn't put such an emphasis on those things that make it sound like somehow Satan is some kind of rival to God. He, he is not. And the reason he is not is because two times in Ezekiel 28, which is, we've taught before, I believe is a reference to Satan, he is called a created being. So Ezekiel 28, verse 13 of Satan, it says, on the day you were created. And then verse 15 repeats you know, the same thing. It says, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. So immediately when you see that word created, you say to yourself, well, this isn't even a, uh, this isn't even a, there's no rivalry here at all. I mean, the only reason Satan is around is because God is using Satan for his own purposes. And once those purposes are exhausted, you'll see God very quickly disposing of Satan into the lake of fire. So Satan has tremendous power compared to us, but you shouldn't inflate it in your mind as somehow he's some kind of rival to God, which he is not. But having said all that, he has tremendous power. He has a reservoir of miracle working power. And you see that described in verse 9. Satan expressing himself through the lawless one. Satan expressing himself through the Antichrist. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders. Now, the three Greek words here are powers. That's the Greek word dunamis. The second word that's used is signs. That's the Greek word simeon. And then the third Greek word that's used there, translated wonders, is teros. So when it says that is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity with all power, that's dunamis, where we get the word dynamite, dynamic. All signs, that's the word simeon, and all false wonders, that's the word teros. And what's interesting is when you study these three words out, you'll see that they're the identical words that are used of the ministry of Jesus when he was on the earth 2,000 years ago performing signs and wonders. So what that means is just as the miracles of Jesus were real, absolutely real, absolutely authentic, absolutely indisputable, the Antichrist, when he shows up, will do signs and wonders of that same caliber. Does Antichrist have as much power as God? No, because that would be a worldview called dualism, which we reject but he's, his power to perform miracles is absolutely true and real. So that's why you can't determine truth by a miracle. Because God performs miracles, so does the devil. So as a Christian, you're always called to test the experience. First uh, John chapter four and verse one. John uh, is very clear on this. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. 
Well, why should I do that, John? John says, I'm glad you asked. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So there's an acceleration, a proliferation of false prophets giving false experiences. And you have to look at the experience and say, is this of God or is this of not of God? And I have to do that because the Bible very clearly tells me that Satan does miracles just like God does. He just doesn't do them at the same power that God can do them at, but he can do them nonetheless, and he can appear godlike to us. So first of all, this word powers, dunamis, where we get the word dynamite, dynamic, used of the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9. That's the same word used to describe the miracles of Jesus in the Gospels. It says in Matthew 11 verse 20, then he, that's Jesus, began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Now the word miracle of Jesus is a translation of the Greek word dunamis, which is the same word used to describe Antichrist's future miracles. Here is dunamis again, relative to the miracles of Jesus. Acts 2.22. Men of Israel, Peter speaking, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles. Dunamis. The second word that's used here is Simeon for sign. We saw that in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9 relative to the Antichrist. Well, that's the exact same word used to describe Christ's signs when he was here on the earth 2,000 years ago. In fact, that word signs appears in a really important verse in John's gospel which is John's purpose statement for the whole gospel. John writes, therefore many other signs, the Greek word simeon, Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John says in his gospel, I'm gonna give you a list of signs. In fact, there's about seven of them, as I'll show you in a minute. And from those signs, I want you to understand who Jesus claimed to be. He claimed to be the Christ, the Son of God. And because he claimed to be the Christ, the Son of God, John has not just a Christological purpose in writing, but a soteriological, evangelistic purpose in writing. I want you to believe in Jesus so that you can have life in his name. And I'm gonna make my case by featuring Christ's seven signs. Sign number one is the changing of the water into wine at Cana of Galilee, John 2. Sign number two is the healing of the nobleman's son, John 4. Sign number three is the healing of an invalid at the pool of Bethesda, John 5. Sign number four is the feeding of the 5,000, John 6. Sign number five is the walking on the water, also John 6. Sign number six is the healing of the blind man, John 9. And sign number seven is raising Lazarus from the dead, John 11. That is the word Simeon sign used to describe all of these things. And what I'm trying to say is that's the same word used to describe what the Antichrist is going to do. So the Antichrist is going to show up and put on a, a show, but for lack of a better expression, that will be on par with what Jesus did. It's just they're lying signs because they're not coming from God. They're coming from the devil. Uh, in John's gospel, people are attracted to Jesus because of his signs. It says, this man came to Nicodemus. This is the, I call it the Nick at night conversation. Nicodemus, it says, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher for no one can do these signs, Simeon, 
that you do unless God is with him. Uh, I read to you earlier Acts 2.22 concerning the ministry of Jesus. There's the word signs again right next to teros. Peter says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, Simeon, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. They could not dismiss the, the miracles of Jesus. So what they did in Matthew 12 is they said that miracle came from the devil, which it could have, as I'll show you. But they got it wrong there because these were miracles done by God. But when the identical Greek word is used in our verse, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9, there's no way you can say that the miracles that the Antichrist is going to do are somehow hokum or you know, David Copperfield magic tricks. I mean, they're going to be real miracles. A lot of Christians are looking for a signs and wonders movement. That's what they're looking for. And what, what the Bible says is it's coming. A signs and wonders movement is coming. It's just the next time around, it won't be God doing the miracles. So, so the world is set up for deception as I'm speaking because, because the world doesn't have a right epistemology. Epistemology is how we know what we know. People determine truth by an experience not understanding that God is not the only author of experiences. By the way, I'm not against the idea that God gives experiences and does miracles. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't pray for anything. But I am also of the view that the devil can do all kinds of miracles also. So if a miracle occurs, it's like, so what? I got to test it. I got to sift it to, to determine if it's of God or of the devil because there's two sources of miracles in our universe, God and the devil, but that doesn't mean we believe in dualism. The third uh, word that's used here is wonders or teros, and that's a word used of the miracles of Jesus also. Acts 2, 22, men of Israel, listen to these words, Jesus the Nazarene, a man tested to you by God with miracles and wonders. That's teros, and then we've already seen signs. So my point is the same words that are used to describe the Antichrist's miracles are the same words used to describe Jesus' miracles in the Gospels, which were 100% real. So the Antichrist miracles will be 100% real as well. Now here's a slide, and I keep adding to it, and we'll probably will as time goes on. When I was teaching at the local Bible college, I told the students, this is the most important slide you will ever see in any of my classes. And then I got even bolder. I said, this is the most important slide you'll ever see at this school. And that latter part, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but that's how strongly I feel about this. Because this slide shows you every single miracle that happens in the Bible that God has nothing to do with. Now, I could make a slide of all of the miracles from God. That would be a much longer slide, but I wasn't interested in that. I mean, of course I'm interested in it, but for our purposes, epistemology, building a right, how we know what we know mindset, I focused on the miracles that happen in Scripture that God has, is not involved with at all. To show you that your Bible from Genesis to Revelation teaches this idea that I'm communicating, that God is not the only miracle working power in the universe. So let's kind of go through this, and don't I see some of you feverishly writing it down, don't worry, I'm not going to take it away, we're just going to work down, down the list here. Um, the first one is Exodus chapter 7 and 8. And here's a chart here that tells you the 10 plagues 
that Moses performed? Water to blood, frogs, gnats, flies, disease, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, death of the firstborn. And you'll notice that with the first two, the magicians of Pharaoh were able to duplicate the plague. Water to blood, they duplicated that in Exodus 7. The multiplication of frogs, they duplicated that. Uh, Exodus chapter 8. Now when they got to plague 3, and this is, this is why one of the reasons you can't be a dualist, once they got to plague number 3 and the multiplication of gnats, they were unable to <clears throat> duplicate what God did. <clears throat> and they said this is the very hand of God. <clears throat> but I think it's very interesting that the first two, the magicians, Pharaoh's magicians, were able to imitate the miracle that Moses did through God's power. Um, <clears throat> the second one on our list is, and we're going to have to look up some verses for this. You guys good with that? <clears throat> the second one is Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 through 3. Moses is instructing the children of Israel as they're about to enter the promised land. And he says in Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 through 3, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign and a wonder. Verse 2, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. So you've got a situation where Moses says you're going to enter Canaan, you're going to see a prophet in there, or prophets, they're going to perform signs or wonders that happen. <clears throat> but they're going to simultaneously say, let's go follow other gods. In other words, they're going to contradict what God already said in the Ten Commandments. No other gods before me, no graven images. What do you do with that circumstance? Well, you test it. These prophets are giving experiences but failing the test. They're contradicting God's revealed word. Verse 3, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet. People today would call that closed-minded. God calls it discernment. You should not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you. See, he's, God is testing you to see if you're going to test this sign or wonder. To find out if you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all, you know, with all of your soul. Verse 4, you shall follow the Lord your God and fear him. You shall keep his commandments and listen to his voice and serve him and cling to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. Wow. Because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to seduce you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from among you. So how, how in the world is these, are these prophets to be put to death performing signs or wonders? Well, the answer is the devil is giving them that power, just like he gave Pharaoh's magicians that power. Third example is the book of Job. You might slip over there for a moment. Job uh, chapter 1 and verse 12. Job chapter 1, verse 12, going through verse 19. You know the story of Job. It says, The Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Notice that God right there is acknowledging Satan has power. Not as much as God's, but he has power. Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand to him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. 
So look at the trouble Satan caused here in this man's life. Verse 13. Now on the day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger to Job a messenger came to Job and said the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them and the Sabaeans attacked and took them. They also slew the servants with the edge of the sword and I alone have escaped. So Satan just caused a war or a skirmish of some kind to destroy Job's livelihood. Verse 16, while he was still speaking, another also came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the serpents and consumed them and I alone have escaped. Notice that the second thing Satan did here in the life of Job is he caused fire to fall from heaven. And it was so real that the guy reporting to Job what happened thought it was the fire of God. Verse 17, while he was still speaking, another came and said, see, if you think you've had a bad day, read this. While he was still speaking, another came and said, the Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid of the camels and took and slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking. (laughs) I mean, these, these uh, tragedies are happening so fast, the other messenger reporting the prior tragedy can't even give the complete report before a new tragedy comes to the surface. While he was still speaking, also came, another also came and said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their older brother's house. And behold, a wind came, so Satan can cause storms, apparently, A wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people and they died and I alone have escaped. So these are all things that are happening of the supernatural order that Satan is orchestrating. If you go to the next chapter, Job 2, verses 7 and 8, This is round two. Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, God, who is not operating by dualism, has to give Satan the ability to do these things. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. He took a potsherd to scrape himself while he was sitting among the ashes. So Satan caused a massive problem in his physiology, some kind of a skin disease or something. And then if that weren't enough, look at Job's wife, which Satan didn't cause. Verse nine, it says, then his wife said to him, do you still, th- do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Wow, talk about some nice family support there. But you'll notice that all of these things, other than the wife, Satan is orchestrating. The next one that I have on the list there is 1 Samuel 28. I have a question mark by that because it's a debated passage. Um, It relates to Samuel from the dead speaking to Saul. And a lot of people think that that's a demon imitating Samuel. But other people, more like myself, say, no, that's actually Samuel speaking. That's what the text says. So God was allowing Samuel to speak from the dead to Saul in this particular occurrence. But if the former interpretation is right, and it's actually a demon impersonating Samuel, then that becomes another example of a satanic miracle. That one, you know, you put a, I put a question mark because it's, it's a debated passage, but it's an interesting one to consider. Number five, let's go to Matthew 7, <clears throat> verses 21 through 23. 
Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, Sermon on the Mount. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Kind of interesting, submitting to Christ's lordship doesn't get you into heaven. Because people are going to say, Lord, Lord. Receiving his free gift of salvation will get you into heaven. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? Jesus speaking, verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So these are people on the day of judgment essentially pleading their own works and their own self-righteousness as a basis for entering the kingdom. And Jesus will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Because you never, <laughs> you don't have a relationship with me on the basis of self-righteousness. <clears throat> you have it on the basis of my transferred righteousness. So you can do all the good works you want on the day of judgment. It's not going to get you out of trouble with God at all. You're either clothed in the transferred righteousness of Christ because you've received by faith as a free gift, what he did for you on the cross 2,000 years ago, or you're standing there kind of like Adam and Eve with their own loin coverings demanding that God accept you based on what you did. So these are people doing the latter. And notice what they're doing here, what they claim to do. They claim to prophesy in your name. I mean, these were people that were prophesying, preaching, proclaiming, predicting in the name of Christ. These were people that were performing many miracles. These were people casting out demons. Well, pastor, are you telling me that Satan is so slick that he could make someone believe they're casting out a demon when they're really not casting out a demon at all? I'm telling you that's exactly true. Satan is the ultimate deceiver. He, Revelation 12, verse 9, deceives the whole world. Yeah, but how could they cast out demons in his name? How could they prophesy in his name? How could they perform not just miracles, but many miracles in his name if they weren't even saved? I'm glad you asked. Satan has the miracle working power. And if this is what Satan has to do to keep people away from Je the authentic Jesus, he'll give people these experiences. Religious people. Um, let's go to Matthew 24, 24. Jesus' Olivet Discourse, speaking about the end of the age. He says, for false Christs and false prophets will arise among you and will show great signs and wonders to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Now, I think the elect here is Israel, the elect nation of God. So even Israel herself, God's elect nation, will be on the verge of deception in the tribulation period because there is going to be false Christs and false prophets. That's very religious language. Prophet, Christ. It's just they're coming from, the power is coming from a wrong source. And notice that they will be able to show in the tribulation period not just signs, but great signs. And not just a wonder, but wonders. And yet they're obviously not of God because they're false Christs and false prophets. So how do they get this ability to perform these signs and wonders if they're not connected to God? Well, the answer is the devil gave them that power. Uh, 
couple books to the excuse me, a couple books to the right, Luke chapter four and verse five. The temptations of Jesus. Luke gives this as I think the second temptation. It says in verse five, and he, now who's he? It's the devil. He led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been given over to me and I can give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it will all be yours. So here is Jesus being taken by Satan to some kind of location and he's given something uh, visible. You know, it doesn't really say how it happened. Is it, is it a dream? Is it a vision? But it was something that Jesus saw because it says he showed him. And he did it, the devil did it, in a moment of time. I mean, how long does it take, take to see all the kingdoms of the world? <clears throat> you could travel the whole rest of your natural life and hardly cover any of the ground. And here's Satan showing Jesus these things in a moment, visibly, right before his eyes. And so obviously for the devil to pull off something like that, he obviously has tremendous miracle working power. Joseph Smith saw a vision. Muhammad, the founder of Islam, saw a vision. Let's go to the book of Acts, <clears throat> chapter eight, verse nine. We'll be coming up to this Wednesday night. It says in Acts chapter eight, verse nine, it says there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. Now, Simon is going to believe but he won't believe until verse 13. I am of the view that Simon became a believer because it says he believed. And that's a big point of controversy that I'll show you when we get to this section in the book of Acts. But even before he became a believer, he was practicing, meaning he did this regularly, magic in the city, that's Samaria, and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. Now, when you test a miracle like that, that can't be from God, because God is all about humility. This guy's using whatever miracle ability he had to make himself great, and um, apparently he was very good at it because he was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people before he believed, as an unbeliever, before having any relationship to God at all. So how was he able to do that? Well, our worldview is such that Satan can give people miracle working power that's very, very real. Uh, let's go to Acts chapter 16 and verse 16. Uh, this is in Philippi. It says, it happened as we, Luke narrating this, we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us, who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. And as you keep reading this, it's actually a demon inside of this slave girl that was giving her this ability to predict the future. Because it says there in verse 18, she continued to do this for many days. She's kind of going around yelling things out, disrupting the apostles' ministry. Verse 18, but Paul was greatly annoyed and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. 
and he came out of her at that very moment. Verse 19, when her masters saw that her hope of, their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged him into the marketplace before the authorities. So they were making a lot of money, apparently, based on this slave girl that they owned and her ability to predict the future. We call that fortune-telling. Paul cast the demon out of the girl. Consequently, her ability to, take, to predict the future was taken away, and this is what got Paul and Silas thrown in jail in Philippi. But you see very clearly, a demon was inside of her, allowing her to predict the future. Can Satan predict the future? To some degree, yes. Not based on omniscience, but he's been around an awful long time time, much longer than we have, because angels don't die. Luke 20, verses 35 through 36, he's a great student of human behavior, and he can make basic guesstimates or generalizations or estimates on what's going to happen tomorrow. He has that ability. Can he do it with the same ability that God can do it as? No, but he can do it Uh, to a very large extent. And this was something that was making money for these owners. So this, this was a very real demon inside of this girl that gave her this power. Let's go to Galatians chapter one, verses six through nine. This one I have on the screen. Paul the Apostle writing to the Galatians, he says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Look at this, verse eight. But even if we or an angel... I mean, doesn't Muhammad say he had a contact with Gabriel, an angel? Doesn't Joseph Smith say he had a contact with an angel named Moroni? If we are an angel from heaven, and here's how you do the test, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Uh, As we have said before, so I say again, that if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. Paul says, I don't want to really hear about your vision. I don't want to hear about your dream. If if you go on and on about an angel appearing uh, at your bedside and it's very real and you see it, Paul says, I'm really not that interested in that unless you've put it through the test. The test is, it can't contradict prior revelation. But the experience can be real. It can be absolutely real. And that is the deception um, that our world is being pulled into because people think it was a real experience. And you know what? It, It could have been real. This is why when you're dealing with experiential oriented people and there's a lot of Christians that are like that, what you're gonna discover, it's, it's a waste of time <clears throat> to try to talk them out of their experience because they really had an experience. What is a, a good use of your time is to communicate to them the proper epistemology, how we know what we know. How do you know it's true? How do you know it's of God? The doctrine has to align with prior revelation. So Paul says you can have an experience with an angel, but it's irrelevant if the angel is preaching to you something contrary to what God already said, because God can't lie. He can't say something on Sunday and say something totally different on Tuesday. That's how you know it's not of God. That's why you say to yourself, well, this is a real experience, but it's not, it's not from God. It's from the other side. 
And then, of course, I have on our list 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9, which is the springboard we're using. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power, signs, and false wonders. Let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter 13. And verse 3. I saw one of the heads, of the beast that is, I saw one of the heads as if it had been slain and his fatal wound was healed. Healed. You mean Satan can heal? Yes, he can. And the whole earth, look at the bad epistemology here, the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. Well, this is a real healing, and it is. So it's got to be from God. In fact, this healing is just as real as the one that Jesus did 2,000 years ago. And because no one is running the beast through the test um, and being a Berean, and they're totally uh, operating based on a bad epistemology which says experience equals truth, the whole world follows after the Antichrist. Look at the same chapter, verse 13. This is the Antichrist's assistant, false prophet. He performs great, not just signs, great signs, mega simeon. So that he even makes fire come down out of heaven from earth into the presence of men. Boy, I think what the news channels are going to do with that. Verse 14, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound at the sword and has come to life. It looks to me like a resurrection here. The Antichrist is dead and he comes back to life. In fact, this word, come back to life, za'o, is the same word used in the same book by the same author, John. I believe it's in Revelation 2. I think it's in verse 8. Describing the resurrection of Jesus. The powers of the Antichrist through Satan are so profound that he's even able to imitate the resurrection of Jesus. Which helps us understand the problems with Andy Stanley, son of legendary preacher Charles Stanley, who I thought was very good, but his son has gone off the rails into apostasy. And Andy Stanley has said, and I've heard him say it a number of occasions, he even showed up not long ago at my alma mater preaching this doctrine, that you don't determine what is true based on what's in the Bible. And Google it. Look at it. You can see it for yourself. You determine what's true because it came out of the mouth of Jesus who resurrected from the dead. So the resurrection is of Jesus is the sole um, criteria for truth, not the Bible. In other words, he says, yeah, I, I believe in the creation days, you know, not, not because it's in the Bible, but because Jesus seemed to talk about them and Jesus rose from the dead, and who can argue with that? Okay, well, what do you do with this text here? where the Antichrist is going to resurrect from the dead also, if I'm understanding my Bible correctly. God never says the sole test of truth is the bodily resurrection from the dead. There's a lot more things that Jesus had going for him than that. That, of course, is the ultimate miracle, but it's not the only miracle. Everything that Jesus said or did lined up with this book, everything. Everything. He never contradicted any Old Testament passage or any scripture written about him before he showed up or written about him after the fact. 
So you look at the resurrection in that light. But if you don't care about that, because you have a worldview that's clipped from biblical truth, and you're totally going based on experiences, you have no intellectual defense when the Antichrist shows up and resurrects also. Now, if you're a Berean, you can test that. and You say, great miracle, but uh, boy, the things coming out of his mouth don't fit the rest of Scripture. Andy Stanley's epistemology is preparing people to receive the Antichrist. That's how serious this is. And he's doing it from the pulpit of the largest church in the United States of America. I think we're, we're, we're um, I think we need some help with this, amen? We're on really troubled waters with this epistemology. Look at verse 15. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast could even speak. And cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. That's a miracle. Almost done, believe it or not. Revelation 16. Verses 13 and 14. This is Armageddon. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, that's the devil, and out of the mouth of the beast... And out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are spirits of demons, watch this, performing signs. Demons performing signs. Which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather together for war for the great day of God the Almighty. Demons under Satan's power, performing signs, drawing the nations of the earth into northern Israel for the final battle called the Battle of Armageddon and supernaturally drying up the Euphrates River to expedite the path of these nations coming from the east. And it's all done by demons <coughs> performing miracles. So with all of this being said, you can see how the epistemology of determining truth by experience only is not biblical. You have to test the experience to see if it conforms with the rest of divine revelation, which I can do for Jesus. He, he matches perfectly. His resurrection was real and his life, doctrine, content fit everything that God said elsewhere. The Antichrist shows up and does something similar. And you say, well, this just doesn't work because what he's saying and what he's doing contradicts God's word. So Antichrist is, is coming. And the miracles are going to be so real that it's going to take the personal advent of Jesus to speak to him and to defeat him. And so... Uh, the next time um, I'm with you, um, uh, we'll look at this final one, the destruction of the lawless one's followers. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your truth, your word, how it equips us for our lives in these last days. Help us to be people that believe in miracles, but at the same time <clears throat> want to test, test the miracles. That's what you've called us to do. You've told us not to believe every spirit, but test the spirits see if they are of God, <laughs> because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Help us to be better discerners and understand the time period that we're living in because of these things. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name, God's people said, and happy intermission.